Uh, and thanks for coming to hear about uh, deep water oil, which I am assuming people don't know too much about. Maybe, maybe you do, but um, yeah, I, the website that Brian mentioned is called Shell Oil's Deep Water Mission to Mars. So you can Google it, and this is the Mars platform, so Shell platform, um, in 3,000 feet of water. So, I got started studying the history of offshore oil in 1996, so about 23 years ago. I just moved, moved to Houston. Um, I didn't know anything about offshore oil. I was working on my dissertation, which was about mining. And uh, I, uh, I got a issue of Business Week magazine in the mail. For those younger people who used to get these postal <laughs> services, <laughs> <laughs> we read them, you know. <laughs> hard copies. Uh, and I opened it up and there was a story called The, the Undersea World of Shell Oil. And had, I was kind of dazzled. They had all these graphics of these platforms and 3,000 feet of water and wellheads on the seafloor with flow lines going back miles to the platform and uh, swimming underwater robots and, you know, all these questions started to come to my mind like, how the hell did this happen? You know, <laughs> Why did I know about this? Who authorized this? And most importantly, how did oil companies make money in drilling for oil in 3,000 feet of water? It must cost a fortune. Um, so that's what I've been trying to figure out for 23 years. I, I, I think I've got some of it down. Um, and I'm going to try to share, it with, share what I've come to understand about it um, with you today. Why companies are drilling in deep water. Why it's important in the industry, um, how this technology evolved, what, what are some of the policy um, aspects of it. Uh, so, and I just, I have a bunch of slides and mostly images, so I'm not going to bombard you with text on these slides. Um, feel free to jump in with questions as I move along. I'm happy to entertain those. We can get into a discussion if you want. So this is uh, global oil production. It's, you know, approaching hundred million barrels a day globally. Um, offshore uh, accounts for about 30%, 30 million barrels a day, from nothing in 19, at the end of World War II to about 30%. Deep water now is around 10.3 million barrels a day globally. In the Gulf of Mexico, which is the you know the pioneering province for deep water, we're up to almost two million barrels a day. I'm from the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and when we say when I say deep water, the industry uh, accepted in industry definition is 400 meters or 1,300 feet. Um, it, and when you get beyond 1,300 feet of water, it, it fundamentally different kinds of designs are involved in different types of practices because you're moving off this continental shelf and you can't put platforms that have uh, that need uh, foundations on the seabed. You have to have floating uh, drilling and floating production facilities, or at least compliant facilities that sort of move with the wave forces. And then uh, in recent years, they've moved into even deep water beyond 5,000 feet, which they refer to as ultra deep water. The uh, BP deep, deep Water Horizon was drilling in about 5,000 feet of water, so right at the edge of deep water. Conventional deep water. So today, I'm gonna, I'll, I just want to. I'm a historian, and I have to explain things historically. So I'm going to go through these. What I see is the four eras of deep water. Um, here's some of the themes I'm going to highlight: importance of geology and geophysics, building global production, policy, globalization. Um, some of these I'll spend a little, probably a little more time on than others. Um, there's another story that I should tell before I get into this. I arrived at, at the, uh, in D.C. to work on the uh, President's Oil Spill Commission in summer of 2010. And a lot of people on the commission and the staff didn't know much about offshore oil. And there was all these discussions about well, why companies, why was BP drilling 5,000 feet of oil? Why are these companies and all these explanations. One was, well, it had to be because of peak oil. Running out of oil and they're desperate to pick up the you know, last remaining scraps, so they're searching in the deepest water possible. 
Um, the other, other explanations, well, the easy oil has been either uh, produced in the United States or under government control in OPEC nations, and this is the only place left to look for, for oil and gas. Uh, another explanation was, oh, the prices were just soaring through the 2000s, so there's an incentive to move into deep water. And there's a kernel of truth that, to all of these explanations, but they're all basically wrong. Um, and that's because it has a much longer history than, you know, I mean, long before concerns about peak oil, long before, um, you know, the nationalizations of the 70s, the oil industry was interested in deep water all along, going back to the early 90s. So, um, so I should say, yeah. you're probably going to get to this, but did the activity ramp up a lot in the last decade or two? I mean, they yeah. started the case. I mean, people date deep water with, around 1995 in the U.S. and the Gulf of Mexico with a shell platform called Augur, and then Mars was the second sort of, you know, fundamentally different floating compliant structure. Um, but I'm going to tell, I'm going to sort of talk about how the industry got there. So yeah, if you look back at this, it looks like it kind of starts here. But yeah, <laughs> right about, you know, the mid-90s, when you look at this as production. Um, but of course the story is longer than that. Uh, I should say that uh, prior to 2006, uh, the industry discovered, discovered about 60 billion barrels in the and then between 2007 and 2012, another 85 billion technically recoverable barrels. Um, the projections going to the future, and I'll talk about this at the end, uh, some people say that half of the remaining conventional oil reserves to be discovered will be found in deep water. Um, Gulf of Mexico is the, you know, the mature offshore province. Uh, this is can't see it very well, but these the, all these dots are platforms, and the dark blue ones are ones that have been removed. So over time, there's been about 6,000 platforms installed in the Gulf of Mexico, a lot of barren depth, water depths. Um, the light blue ones are still ones operating. These are all active leases. And you can see the concentrate. This is the deep water. This is for administrative purposes the deep water line. It kind of follows the continental shelf. So leases inside that are, have a five-year term limit. Uh, between, between, you know, uh, 1,300 feet by 5,000 feet, they have an eight-year term limit, and then beyond, you know, um, 5,000 feet, you have, you have 10 years to, to work your leases. So these are all the active leases right now. Can't, if you look on the website, um, I actually have an interactive GIS now, so you can go in and look at every, every Every lease, um, you know, every pipeline, every well has information about it. Uh, these are shipping fairways where it's a lot of ships to get. You can't put a platform in these fairways. Uh, so the name of the game in the oil business is finding as much oil as you can for as low low cost as you can before your competitors. And since the 1930s. Uh, the way that companies try to gather, they try to gather as much information as they can uh, from the subsurface before they ever drill a well. Uh, and seismic surveying is seismic reflection technology was something that developed in the 1930s. So you, you have a sound source, at that time it was dynamite, and you would, you would uh, create an acoustic signal that would bounce off sub, subsurface layers and you, you'd uh, you know, collect a geophone that was onshore or a hydrophone that was offshore, and then you, it was recorded on magnetic tape and analog form, and you, uh, you know, uh, put it, uh, process it onto paper records and sort of try to interpret the squiggles and match it up with the geology. Um, but in the early 1960s, there were, there were one of the foundational technologies that's led to deep, deep water was the the uh, introduction of digital recording and processing. So, before most industries in the world adopted digital technology, they were using it in, uh, in exploration. Um, in fact, oil companies have the most powerful computers that they have, they have ever since the 1960s. I just read a story about E&I, the Italian company, 
they just installed a supercomputer outside of the, their at their headquarters outside of Milan that can process 18 petaflops of data, um, which is a quadrillion floating point. Uh, what's it called? I had to look this one up. Um, <coughs> floating point operations per second. That's three times faster than Facebook's fastest computer and two times faster than NASA's. And that, this is just the Italian one. So they started, and every innovation in digital technology, digital seismic technology, was proved and commercialized offshore since the 60s forward. Because um, every, it's expensive to outfit a seismic crew um, on land or offshore, but there are a lot more economies to scale to data gathering offshore. There, there are no forests and ravines and mountains and landholders to negotiate mm -hmm. when you're offshore. So you can collect a lot more data over a crew month as to how they measure it. And so, um, you know, the, the cost per data per profile is much lower offshore. And so companies started using digital technology um, and getting much better signal to noise uh, ratios. So you can filter, you can use digital um, methods to filter out signals and manipulate the data, just like you can do with any kind of, you know, audio signal or any kind of digital data. It's, you know, it, so it allowed uh, companies to get much greater resolution of the, of the subsurface. The other foundational technology uh, was floating drilling, also around the same time. Um, Semi-submersibles, so this was the very first semi-submersible. Deepwater Horizon was like a fourth generation. Semi-submersible that have these pontoons underneath and um, anchors that, that moor it in place. Um, and so you can drill without having, without needing uh, any kind of attachment to the sea bottom. So theoretically, you could you know, dr drill in any depth of water. Uh, and that really changed the game in the early 1960s. Uh, at the same time, uh, there's another floating drilling uh, technology, uh, they're called drill ships, and they're dynamically positioned. And both of these were, again, shell, shell guys invented these things. Um, dynamic positioning is that you just, it's just that you, you don't have any uh, anchors or mooring lines. You have thrusters underneath, and you, you take readings from the sea and communicate those to the thrusters, and they position the, the ship exactly where you want it. And uh, so, Drilling moved to dynamic, these eventually were dynamically positioned. Everything out offshore now is dynamically positioned. Not just the drilling vessels, but the crew, the crew boats and the work boats. Everything is deep. So if you go to New Orleans and get off the, and leave the airport, you see all these billboards, DP training. Um, people doing technical training to be DP, uh, dynamic positioning operators. Um, I'm trying to move quickly because I don't want to so too much of the time. Those are the two foundational technologies, digital seismic, floating drilling, that push the industry into like um, you know, five, 600 feet by the end of the 1960s in the Gulf. Also in the North Sea. North, well, not, not the 60s. North Sea started in the early 1970s, but they were immediately going into that, those depths. Another major turning point, uh, late 60s, early 70s, was uh, companies were getting the, this really good seismic data, and they're, they're finding algorithms to process it uh, into very vivid images. And a couple uh, smart geophysicists at Shell and Mobile started looking at some of, the, some of these profiles, they called them, and seeing these kind of, like, uh, Mike Forrest at Shell called them bright spots. It seems like, it seems like the, these images on the, these amplitude anomalies are associated with oil and gas. And everyone, everyone was like, you gotta be kidding, you can't find oil and gas in a seismic record, because seismic was mainly used to delineate structures, to find salt domes and faults, and the differences between uh, rock composition. No one thought you could actually see the oil and gas on the seismic. But, lo and behold, it was true 
Um, it's not foolproof. It doesn't work in hard rock areas. It really only works in, in sedimentary geology because the, 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 the sound signal has a slight difference in velocity when it goes from water to oil to gas. And you really need sort of precision seismic to pick that up. But they started doing that. And this was a game changer because, you know, when you, if you can see where the oil and gas is before you ever drill a well, well, you increase your accuracy, you lower uh, the number of dry holes that you drill. And that's what's expensive, is drilling a well and not bringing up any oil and gas from it. So it's kind of like a, you know, a batter going from hitting 300 to hitting 600. Kind of like the Washington Nationals in the second year. <laughs> Unfortunately for me, the Astros. Um, so they could t so they could take the savings from drilling dry holes and put it into investing in new technologies to take them out deeper. The first big um, bright spot discovered for Shell was a <clears throat> prospect called Cognac, and they give them these names. These co these are code names because um, you know the the Gulf of Mexico is plotted in a, into a grid of 5,760 square acre blocks. And they have blocks like Mississippi Canyon, 252, that was the Deepwater Horizon, or Green Canyon, 190. And if you're, if you're sitting over beers or lunch in Houston and you refer to Green Canyon 190, and you think there might be, you know, um, oil at, at 9,000 feet, 12,000 feet, and someone over here is fine. So they use these code names, uh, you know, and it's interesting the, the names that they come up with. It often has very personal. Um, the funniest story that I know is uh, that BP had a prospect, deep water prospect, um, in 7,000 feet of water that uh, the chief geologist working at, who's now the head of exploration for BP, named Cindy Yielding. She's a big fan of Neil Young and Crazy Horse. So she named the prospect Crazy Horse. Um, but the Lakota got upset about cultural and religious appropriation, so they changed the name to Thunder Horse. Um, so and that's one of the biggest fields in the Gulf of Mexico. Anyway, that's just an little side. So the, you can't see it very well, but this was in a thousand feet of uh, the first platform, a thousand feet of water. They didn't have barges big enough to put a steel jacket platform there in one place. So they built in three pieces and mated them in the water. It's just a crazy wild engineering um, challenge. They shell won the you know the civil engineering achievement award for that year. Uh, first of unprecedented three uh, civil engineering achievement awards they won. Um, but it, it, it sort of took it, I consider this the first deep water platform. A thousand feet of water, you're right at the edge of the shelf. You're starting to get information about um, you know the rocks and the and this the geology just down the shelf, um, and it, it's kind of, you know, pioneered several other large platforms. At the same time, Brazil was moving out on their, um, for the edge of their continental shelf. I should also mention that the oil shock in 1970 had a lot to do with this. Had a lot with um, Shell being able to spend $214 million on, just on the leases alone not even on the drilling of the, of the structure. So this, you know, encouraged companies to start spending um, and, you know, moving into frontier areas where there's, where no one's ever, never been tested by the drill, that's, that's where you have a chance of finding elephant-sized fields, big fields. Um, this was 200 million barrels, pretty substantial field, but, you know, not, not really that large compared to others. Um, Brazil started moving out too. Uh, they they were t they were completely dependent on imported oil, no oil production in Brazil, and the oil shock really created a balanced payments problem uh, for the country and for the military regime. And they were desperate to find oil uh, to reduce their import bill, and um, they made some discoveries, but they didn't have time to wait for the seven years to build a platform like Shell's Cognac, so they adopted uh, a temporary production system where they used a tanker and used wellheads on the seafloor, which Shell had a 
also pioneered in the early 1960s, but they're very, it's very finicky to have well, well heads on the sea floor. There's all sorts of problems with them. Um, you know, high pressures and temperatures. And you'd much rather have them on the surface. But to get the oil flowing quickly, they put these well heads on the sea floor and they bring the oil to a tanker and it fills up and you bring a shovel tanker and you take the oil back to shore. You don't need a pipeline um, like you do with the other platforms. And this is called a floating production storage and offloading facility, FPS so. Um, so, uh, so it's really, sh sh and then Shell and Petrobras started competing and cooperating technically. Uh, uh, Petrobras, even though it was a state-owned oil company under military control, did a lot of, uh, brought in a lot of technical expertise from the United States and from Houston to process their seismic. They were using bright spots to make these discoveries in the compost space. So Rio de Janeiro is right, right here. It's right off Rio de Janeiro, Rio de Janeiro State. Um, and so they were kind of keeping, they were sort of keeping in step with the other. Of course, they didn't have the same kind of financial constraints because it's a state-owned oil company. Throw all sorts of money at the end. So I, I assume this is kind of implicit in the way you set this up. But so if you think about the 60s, 70s, this is happening with deep interest and focus within the oil industry, obviously, although within particular firms more than others. I take it that the awareness of what's going on is spotty amongst NGOs, government agencies, oh, yeah. um, maybe some financial analysts, but not many. No. Well, no, no, no financial analysts, no. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. right. I mean, they're, but this yeah. is sort of a typical lag of yeah. the rest of the, the whole, world. This is the whole thing about offshore. It's out of sight, out of mind. I mean, it's not there. You don't see it. And it's way offshore, unless it's California, where in the 60s they, were, they built them. But the shelf in California falls off real fast. You get a golf ball in the fire if you want. And the Gulf of Mexico is different. If you can go 20 miles out and still be in 10 feet of water, 30 miles out. So it's very gradual. That's why. That's one reason why the you know companies sort of you know did their trial and error experiments, experimentation in the Gulf because you could move slowly up. Yeah. So apart from state controls um, here in this case, uh, leasing is typically then like the Gulf of Mexico from the federal government of the U.S. Oh, I should explain. Yeah, good question. I should explain this. So the Outer Continental Shelf uh, belongs to the federal government beyond three miles in most. Parts of the U.S. Coast. Texas, you know, unique as Texas is, they, they control out to three leagues or ten and a half miles. This is a big story in the book that I'm writing. I won't go into it now, but beyond three miles, it's federal territory. Up to 100. Uh, no, it's, um, well, it wasn't, at this point in time, it wasn't really settled, um, but under the UN Law of the Sea Convention, I see the United Nations uh, <laughs> sweatshirt on, 200 miles. Exclusive economic zone. All nations are entitled to have sovereignty over minerals and fisheries. They don't have title to the seabed, but they have economic rights, primary economic rights out to 200 miles. Now, you may have heard what's going on in the Arctic. If you can prove, if a nation can prove that its physical continental shelf extends beyond the 200 miles, you can apply to the UN for an extended recognition of extended continental shelf, which all these nations are doing in the Arctic, except for the United States, because the United States is not a signatory to the UN law and sea commission. Thanks to people like Jesse Helms and Oliver North and, and, uh, and the people who think that black helicopters are flying around out of the United Nations and you know, threatening our sovereignty. Isn't this also how Norway got control of significant resources in the North Sea by being quicker than other North, Northern European neighbors to sort of make those claims so that they have sort of... And that was not, they, you can divide and include by water. Nations have to do a treaty to do that. And England gave Norway a, you know, a generous condition. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, a, that's again another, yeah. another story. But that, was, uh, that was through the treaty. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so no, yeah, Norway ended up with some significant field. Quick follow up. So none of this is occurring outside of um, national, any national jurisdiction? No. No. Well, in the 70s, there was talk, I mean, and this was what sort of 
brought about the need to, for a law of the sea convention and made it very controversial is that companies wanted to mine in, you know, the deep Pacific Ocean for manganese modules. And, you know, what is this common heritage of mankind? That's what was eventually written into the law of the sea convention. And the United States opposed that as well, declaring that the, the deep oceans were common heritage. But no, all no, and all offshore drilling takes place in the national jurisdiction. Okay, so um, beyond the shelf, that's where politics comes in. So um, Shell installed cognac in a thousand feet of water, paid two hundred million dollars for leases, and companies started to get frustrated that the government was rationing out these leases, these block five hundred. 5,760 square acre blocks, and they weren't getting, uh, they weren't providing enough opportunity. Because they would, it would, you know, the way it worked is that you would submit, they would ask the company for nominations, and, the, and then the Bureau of Land Management this time would sort of select, okay, well, block this block, this block, this block. Um, but oil fields, you know, extend beyond those boundaries, and companies wanted to be able to collect multiple blocks. Well, the way it worked in the 70s, if you made a, you made a discovery on an oil field, and it, but the field extended into a, an additional block, that comes up for auction, it's a sealed build auction, and everyone's bidding on it. it drives the price up. They started complaining to government, we need you know you got to bring down the price of upfront prices of leases. The way it works is you you go to an auction and you make a it's called a, you bid you put a signature bonus bid in. That's a bid to a price to obtain the lease. And then if you end up producing oil, you pay the royalty. But the bonus bids were just out of sight, you know, driven up by all this competition, and they found a shortage of lease opportunities and rising oil prices. So they got their wish with James Watt, who became the Secretary of Interior in, under Reagan. And instead of just rationing block by block, Watt, who uh, promised to lease a billion acres on the outer continental shelf for oil and gas, said, OK, we're, we're going to move to uh, this new New system, this was suggested to them by the oil companies, area wide leasing. So we're just going to throw these whole planning areas up for, for auction. You can bid on anything you want, and as many as many as you want. And they lower the minimum price that will we'll allow you to. So companies went into these auctions between 1983 and 85, and especially Shell, scooped up dozens and dozens of these deep water tracks in contiguous. Um, you know, leaseholds, they created these inventories where they, you know, they were sure, and they paid a pittance for uh, bonus prices, because throwing this all open, you know, drove down the competition. You, you know, you'd have 10 bids on, you know, uh, a lease prior to this, and then you'd have, you know, sometimes not, no more than one or two, on, and they were able to collect huge inventory leases. And that was important, because you, you have to also remember that it sounds like it's just like marching forward, and the you know the companies are driving this, and the leadership of the companies are you know all behind this. It's not the case. It's, at every step of the way, it was a hard sell to the upper management to move into ever ever deeper waters. Presidents of oil companies did this; they were scared of all this stuff, <laughs> and they, they you know they didn't want it. Was it was scary? This this is scary stuff. But they but it's the it's really the Geologists and geophysicists said, you know, we can make this happen, and the production engineers, yeah, if, we, if the price is right, we can find a way to produce it. And so they, um, <coughs> but by having this cheap leasehold, they would not invest, they would not invest in the technology to develop oil without it, right? I mean, it wouldn't make any sense to spend all this money in technology if we weren't sure that you could get a lease at what you consider an affordable price and have a large inventory this time. So about this time, all these new technologies were being commercialized and introduced in offshore and onshore. Um, I'll try to go through these fairly quickly. Um, high, oil, high oil prices helped out. Uh, but one was uh, measurement well drilling. Has anyone ever heard of this? So when you drill a well, higher this, you, you know, put the Drill down, big long drill stem, 
thousands of feet. About every thousand feet, you have to pull it all back up. And you put down well log, logging tools to, that can take measurements and tell you what kind of rock you're in or what the pressures are. And so you run, run your log tools, up, drill another thousand feet, pull the, pull the stem out again, run your tools. It's very, it takes a long time. Well, in um, the 1970s, they developed a kind of mud, what's called a mud pulse telemetry system where you could log while you're drilling. So you don't have to pull the drill stem out. You have to you know, double, triple the speed of drilling. And this is also important for fracking, this uh, measurement while drilling. Top drive system, you imagine a, a, a drill pipe, like it's like a, a, little, a straw, like a metal straw. And prior to the 70s, you had something called a Kelly, uh, uh, you know, a um, Kelly joint and rotary table. And it's like if I had a straw and I was turning it like this, the, the force was being applied horizontally. That's how you turned it. Well, the um, company uh, named Oil Well Varco developed this top drive system. That's like taking a power drill mm -hmm. and drill, drilling it down. Okay. Yeah. Quick question. Were they, they weren't using turbo drill? But they with the motor at the bottom? Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're electric, but they're electric and, and, then, and then turbo drills. But there's still nothing like having a, you know, a 1600 power horsepower engine, you know, pushing, pushing on, the drill, on the drill stick. And then, you know, you've got steerable motors. So now, so now you can drill fast. You can drill right to where you, you, you want or where, and you get information back. So this really changed things. Um, other technologies, subsea wells, where you could, um, which you could tie back to a platform, were becoming improved, so you'd have as many problems with paraffin and sand clogging them up. Um, so if you have, so you put a platform in on the shelf uh, over a, a major oil field, but you say you find some smaller oil fields, it doesn't doesn't make sense. It's not cost effective to put another platform, but you could put a subsea well and tie it back, yeah. What, what proportion of all of these really important technological innovations came from the big majors as opposed to supply companies or, and then some, the second part of that question is the extent to which there was a strong cross-licensing culture. So the sort of diffusion, Shell figure something out, are they making it available through licensing arrangements? Is, a, is that the culture? <coughs> the yes, that's the culture, uh, in fact, after Shell invented the subsea wells and invented semi submersible drilling rig in 1960, uh, in 1959, 1960, they went to a lease sale and tried and bid on all these deep water leases. Deep water at that time was 300 feet. And the government wouldn't let them happen because there was no competition. So then Shell, in, 19, in January, February 1962, held uh, a three-week conference. They invited all the oil companies, all the contracts, and they shared all the technology. Because they realized they weren't going to be able to go out into deep water alone. And they needed to create a contracting industry because they would do all the all this stuff themselves. So, so multiple so. drill bits raises all boats. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. They you created and this happened again in deep water. Now, I'll get to that. So you have you had it, you have this contractor industry you know, from Schlumberger and Halliburton and, you know, Cameron making blowout preventers. I mean, they, 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 the oil majors who were active offshore in the 50s and 60s active, cultivated and promoted the contractor industry. And so, you know, it's a lot of the, a lot of the innovations up until the 90s, especially, in, you know, sort of, well, certainly in the geology and geophysics side, happened in uh, oil company research laboratories until they shut those down in the, in the 90s and, and started encouraging contractors to do all the R&D. Um, but you also had, you know, you know, a lot of a, it's a, the contracting industry for offshore is vast. So there's an annual conference in Houston called the Offshore Technology Conference. And they get somewhere between 50 to 100,000 attendees every year from around the world. 100,000, maybe 150,000 oil prices are high. Oil prices are low, maybe near 50,000 showing up. It's a trade show and technical papers. So, you know, the, the oil company, they don't compete on 
drill technology and production technology, they would like to have this diffused as widely as possible. Where they compete with is geophysics, finding out where the oil is. And that's what they hold very close to their chest. So does that, does that kind of answer? Yeah. You? Yes. I mean, I can go, I can run down the names of all the, you know, well, they're you have the drilling contractors, you have the well services people, you have the transportation and supply uh, part of it all. I mean, that, that, those are locally Louisiana companies, now growing into big. You have mud logging companies. Um, Anything that's a, that you could think of as a diviner's rod that you keep to yourself. Right. Catering companies, helicopter companies. Started using helicopters in the, in the 1950s. Um, a lot of Vietnam vets fly helicopters out to these platforms. Um, remotely operated vehicles, when you get below about 1,000 feet, it's too deep for human divers. You had divers doing a lot of the underwater work on the shelf, and when you get below 1,000 feet, you can't, you know, it's too dangerous. So they developed these um, you know, remote control robots that do all the work on the seafloor and do all the maintenance and pipeline repairs. And, um, if you're, uh, you know, if you're, for those looking for, still looking for an occupation, you can make a cool six figures flying one of these things offshore. Um, it's kind of like video games. You know, it's, you know, it's for the video game generation. You know, I keep encouraging my son to. <laughs> yeah. Look at this. Um, so, and then Shell kind of brought all this together and outfitted a, a drill ship and demonstrated and got it rated by, you know, the American Bureau of Shipping and the international rating agencies for to drill in six to seven thousand feet in the early 1980s. And then um, here's the key. So. They got the leases. Yeah, to put this in context, to six to seven thousand feet to get to the surface, to the sub, the sea bed. The sea bed. Six thousand yeah. feet of water, and then another ten thousand. Yeah, feet that's water. that's right. Or sometimes yeah. fifteen thousand feet. Um, this was they actually did this in, believe it or not, the Baltimore Count Canyon of the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, they had they actually had leases there. They didn't find anything, but. Um, they could do a lot. Of, they did a lot of testing, and then they brought this to the Gulf of Mexico. Okay, so still, this is a lot of money to spend. You know, how you, how how still how can you make money on this? Well, they had a theory, and they, they, you know, Shell and Petrobras had done a lot of geological work with bright spots, seismic sequence stratigraphy. Um, it was another thing that Exxon pioneered, so you can. You can sort of model the depositional patterns off the off the edge of the shelf, and they, re they realized that these the sandstones that they were looking at were called the turbidites, um, and these are form, you know formed by ancient the ancient Mississippi River funneling large amounts of coarse grain sediment off the shelf, and then being channeled by these what they call turbidity currents into deep water. Now they knew they knew that there was, there was oil in deep. I forgot to mention this. The the Shell Eureka drill ship did a bunch of coring, uh, not well drilling, but coring in the 1960s, where they took you know the top layer of the of the seabed right in the middle of the Gulf, just to see what the sediment was, and they found shows of oil, in, I think 3,000, 5,000 feet. So they knew there the oil that gen generated in the in the deep sea. And these were turbidites. And the theory, and they had a theory, and they did a lot of research and worked it over so they're confident that their theory would work, but that they would, these would be highly productive. They're coarse grains, which means so they're highly porous, and a lot of room for hydrocarbons, very permeable, and also under a lot of pressure, with the shales overlaying them in deep. Deep water, you have water and <coughs> sediment and you know, these highly pressurized, very porous and permeable um, turbidite sandstones. And when Shell drilled into Augur, they, they, when Shell, they, they made a bunch of discoveries in the 1980s, Petrobras and Shell. 
huge discoveries, but they weren't sure that they could still make money on it. So Shell discovered Mars, Augur, Powell, Pe Petrobras had a string of major discoveries, which they announced publicly. Shell just kept quiet. And so um, when Shell uh, built the Augur platform, which came in 1995, these wells produced what they, even beyond their expectations. So here, here's to give you a sense. Um, a shallow well in the Gulf of Mexico will produce 1,000 to 1,500 barrels a day in that one well. Onshore, it's even less. Frack wells are produced much less than that. The turbinite sandstones in deep water produce 10, 20, 30, even 40,000 barrels a day from a single well. That's like a cash register. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you can spend a billion dollars on a platform and recover your cost in a year. And the platform goes on producing for another 30. Um, so that, that's, that's the economics of deep water. That's why, the, that's why the companies are drilling in deep water. Turbidite sands, you find, then you find turbidite sandstones. Um, well, I'm getting ahead of you. Another, another important th uh, development this time was three-dimensional seismic. So uh, once they realized how the economics of the deep water play, they could start throwing more, size, more expensive seismic at it and further refine their prospects. Um, and you had you know, now workstations with higher computing power, and you could, you could run a 3D survey and put it into a, you know, a, you know, a computer screen and you can move it around and you can see it in three dimensions. By the 1990s, G&G uh, uh, &G companies in Houston had these visualizations where you can actually walk in and walk and take a, a you know a walking tour through the through the reservoir. Um, and this was all developed all, going back to digital seismic by GSI, Geophysical Services Incorporated out of Dallas. You probably never heard of it, but you might have heard uh, of a company that it created during World War II called Texas Instruments. Mm -hmm. These are all, and the, all, you know, all these guys are MIT PhDs. Um, this is another uh, another moment where the industry gets together and has to figure out how it's going to. They discovered their oil. They know they're producing. How are they going to, you know, create a contractor industry and? Solve many of the technical technical challenges. So, a consortium was created called Deep Star. It sounds kind of ominous, like Deep Star Six or Death Star. Um, but all the major oil companies came together, and contractors, and governments, officials, to and they they have these you know you know like three year plans where they, they attack the common technological problems that the industry is facing. It still exists today, it's, but it started in 1991. And then you have, so you have this boom, you know, and, and moving to all sorts of different concepts. Shell chooses the t tension leg platform, which is these big holes and these steel tendons that are under tension, which allows the, allows the platform to bob a little bit. Uh, you know, so, you know, you could put a steel platform in this well, depth of water and just be crushed by the wave forces and hurricanes. Um, so there are all sorts of, these all, all these design concepts, FPSOs were developed. Petrobras then moved to using these exclusively. Um, I can talk about why those were, have not been common in the Gulf of Mexico, but I'll move on so I'm sure we have some questions. So here's Shell's Mars platform, the one I had the website. About. I just wanted to highlight this is how much uh, Shell paid for the Cognac leases, the Cognac platform. This is how much they paid for the Mars leases. So, um, yeah. Because of that change in the rate in years? Change in leasing system. Yeah. That's how far, that's how much it fought down the cost of the, uh, the lease prices. They're still paying royalties. Still cost a billion dollars uh, more. And so it didn't take long to go from the Gulf of Mexico. It was also right around the time of a, sort of the second oil bust. Bust. Really prices bust. So a lot of companies were like, I'm still, that's a fact. Go out, go out in your deep water, you're never going to find anything. We're not interested. So it was only a, only a handful of intrepid companies that did this. Yeah, but that's a good point. Um, so, you, so, you know, tur turbinites are not just off the Gulf of Mexico, not just off of Brazil, but off the west coast of Africa. 
And in the early 1990s, Angola and Nigeria started offering sweet terms for companies to explore offshore production sharing uh, agreements, they're called, and go into those. Huge discoveries off of Angola, and uh, mostly off of Angola. Big discovery off of Nigeria. I mean, uh, Elf, French company Elf, in 1996 made two billion barrel discoveries off of Angola. So, you know, so, so not as much though in the in the river deltas in Asia. They um, they were that's still yeah there there wasn't a lot of success there. Um, I think it's mostly gas prone, They're looking for oil. Um, I'm not. I know they were, you know, looking. They didn't have as much success. Um, I know. I don't know the Asia story as much, but it's, it's starting to become more active, especially in the South China Sea yeah. <coughs> and Malaysia and Australia. It was just kind of a, there was kind of a lag. I mean, um, you know, this is all <coughs> sort of you can, contractors can move from one part of the corner to the other, you've got a lot of the same companies. The geology is very similar because these were connected. I mean, the geology of West Africa is a mirror image of Brazil. So, um, they call it the Golden Triangle. Um, and these three areas added six million barrels a day to global crude oil production between 1995 and 2005, um, which was very significant because so this is when Oil supplies were starting to get tight again. China, Chinese demand was growing. And, um, the other big development in the late 1990s was again increasing uh, computing power, allowed for better imaging even beneath the salt. So a lot of these regions, especially Brazil and, and Gulf of Mexico, have a lot of salt. Um, and in early deep water, you're drilling into these little basins here that are between the salt. Salt traps oil. The problem is with uh, seismic prior to the mid-1990s, you couldn't image beneath the salt. Because it, it, it deflects and distorts the signal. You need a lot of computing power to make all those corrections. And they had that by the to the late 1990s, so they started moving deeper and drilling through the salt. And this is where BP comes in. They let the head of shell into seven, five, seven thousand feet of water and started drilling subsalt deep water wells. And Brazil was doing the same. Um, you know, it took, you have to use a lot, you have to run a lot of uh, seismic boats in a lot of different directions to get all this data that you can composite correct, and you can, then, you can, then you can see the, the images beneath the salt. That's, that's huge. And that, so um, that kind of pushed the industry further into ultra deep water. Um, I will, I'm going to leave some time. I, I can talk a little bit about that. You know, all these different plays in, in you know, 8 to 10,000 feet of water in the Gulf of Mexico. Brazil in 2007 drilled what they, through what they call the, into the pre-salt. It's different, it's, it's a, the mother layer of salt. Much, you know, much greater distance than subsalt, where you're drilling through what's called the loch of salt. The mother layer is down here in the Gulf, and the salt is pinched up, so you're not, it's not as challenging as, the, you know, the mother layer of salt in, the, in the Brazil, once they found, Pre-salt in Brazil, you go over to Africa, discoveries in Ghana, and you know, Senegal, and Mauritania, and, and uh, Ivory Coast. A uh, lot of problems in the 2010s that kind of slowed down the deep water. Um, big disaster in Brazil, hurricanes in Katrina that damaged a lot of infrastructure in the Gulf. Lower tertiary is a different kind of beast than the conventional deep water. There's problems with that. Scandal in Brazil. Over, <laughs> uh, I don't know if you paid attention to that. It's still sort of reverberating in that country, Deepwater Horizon. And then big 
crude oil price slump and you know, people's companies sort of lost their appetite for deep water until about last year, now it's picking up again. Um, and um, using new kinds of technologies, but you're seeing the spread of deep water around the world. Uh, big discoveries, Exxon has made huge discoveries, starting in 2015, huge discoveries off of Guiana. Two billion barrels in counting. Every well they drill there, it hits oil. Um, there's another small American company called Cosmos, which made the discovery off of Ghana, the Jubilee Field, which is another two billion barrel field. There's an interesting documentary about that called Big Men. I recommend seeing that. Um, Mediterranean, big gas fields now in deep water, Mediterranean off of Egypt, Cyprus, Israel, and Lebanon. Uh, kind of a tragic irony. I can't remember which Israeli statesman said this, but he said it was too bad that the Jews spent 2,000 years wandering around the, the deserts of the Middle East and then settled in place, the only place that didn't have any oil. Um, but now they have a big gas field, but the problem is they don't have any market for it. So, <laughs> uh, it you know, because uh, there's all this, the only mar the natural market is Europe, and you've got LNG coming from the US, and, and gas from Russia, and huge gas fields there. Uh, gas being discovered off of Madagascar, huge gas and floating LNG facilities here, all those gas is going to go to China and Japan. Um, this is just a kind of projection, so we're at about seven, well, even probably one more like eight million barrels a day from deep water. And, um, this is, these are planned and announced um, off deep water projects that will bring it up to, that will add another eight million barrels a day by 2025. There's a lot more to say, but I think I'll stop and let you ask questions. <laughs> Yeah. So I have a question about the, um, you talked about the industry-wide R&D consortium the, from 1991 forward. Was that, also, but yeah, was that also a political strategy to get more major industries in this as kind of lobbying forces and protectors of what they were doing? I don't it, think so. It's purely, uh, it te purely that, technical. I don't, uh, I, I don't think so. It's uh, purely a technical consortium. I mean, they leave the lobbying to, you know, the, no, the oil companies wouldn't entrust their technical consortium. Oh, I think it was R and D. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, understood it. Like, um, so you have like groups like Greenpeace and others saying, "Leave it in the ground," right? Yeah. And this huge thing is developing. This is the issue, right? Yeah. So, where does this? So, where does this fit into the climate now? change yeah. Yeah. issue problem? Yeah. Okay. So, there's one one way that I like to look at it. Print of deep water is actually pretty small. I mean, you know, we have the deep water rising. Terrible. We can't afford that in other words. And it's disturbing uh, what the Trump administration has done to sort of roll back one of the safety regulations that were implemented under Obama. Um, five, say five deep water platforms in the Gulf of Mexico produce the same amount of primary energy as all the solar and wind installations in the United States combined. Um, you know, more, not as much as fracking, but fracking has this huge environmental and geographical footprint. So in some ways you can, you can look at trade-offs that way. Um, a lot of the new deep water, as I mentioned, especially outside the Atlantic Basin, is gas. And um, I mean, you know, there, I know there's some people want to leave all fossil fuels in the ground, but gas emits half the CO2 that coal does. And so that gas can be liquefied and sent to China so they can stop uh, in India coal plants off the line, I think that's a good thing for the climate. But you're still at, you know, you're still adding hydrocarbons, and we're kind of in a, in a crisis. Um, another way to think about this is producing, consuming 100 million barrels uh, a day. Now the natural decline for most oil fields, you know, globally is we, because of natural depletion, we lose about 6 million barrels a day. So the industry is to, to maintain, to meet that demand, is having to find six million barrels a day every year. Okay, and so the the, I, I mean, the International Energy Agency has these projections. I mean, everyone makes these projections, and they're you know they're high degree of uncertainty and error. 
But they have two scenarios. One is called the new policy scenario, where we assume that, where, that even with population growth that, uh, and existing policies and committed policies to deal with climate change are implemented, existing and already committed, that will we'll sort of be uh, you know, at 100 million barrels steadily out to 2040. Okay, that's one, that's one scenario that kind of doesn't seem acceptable. Because you're still <laughs> now they have something called a, a sustainable development scenario, where there's, by 2040, global production consumption goes from 100 million barrels down to 70. That's a substantial drop, especially with the growing population gets to 9 million people. That's a substantial drop of, of 1.5 million barrels a day or every year. Okay, but even with that drop and factoring in national uh, natural decline. We're, we're still, even under the sustainable development scenario, we still need to find four and a half million barrels a year to, to even, you know, keep oil at 70 million barrels. Now, some people think about that, they're like, well, just let it drop. Um, but I think, you know, if it drops too fast in a growing, popula growing population, industrializing world, there's going to be major geopolitical issues with that. So, one way to look at it is deep water, you know, is kind of holding us. I mean, it's a, it's a, for the majors, this is, the, this is their game. Big capital, big project management. But, you know, steady, substantial returns over time. And I would say even that the, all the, the golden triangle in the 1990s was a major factor in the oil industry mega mergers from 1998 to 2000. BP, Amoco, Combine, also Arco, and ExxonMobil, and Chevron Texaco. This allowed them to amass the kind of capital and project management expertise and political heft to take on the uh, take on these projects. Um, they still have they still operate in partnership because you, know, you can't. It's too much risk to spend five or ten billion dollars on, on so. But. But again, you're you know you're locking in this new fossil fuel infrastructure, which you know is, is troublesome. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Tom. Just a, a quick question: is, I'm wondering, is there a longer history of this even with uh, exploration in the Caspian, for example? Where? Why? Why Shell? I guess on why, why in the '60s? Um, does, it, does it extend even further? The or? Caspian. Well, like, yeah, go back to Baku sure. in the 1890s, but they didn't they didn't start. Uh, going offshore deeper than the Caspian until the collapse of the Soviet Union. And it's not really deep water in the Caspian, it's much easier, except when you get up north, where you have a lot of ice, and so Chevron has this big development called Cashigan, uh, which has cost them, I think, $60 billion so far in county, and they're not really even producing oil yet, from it, or just starting to. Um, that's, a, that's a different, and it got, it got, I mean, Amer American and, and British companies tried to go into post-Soviet Russia and, 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 the, and the Central Asian countries, and it didn't turn out very well for them. Um, although, you know, BP and Chevron are there, but they have a whole bunch of different companies. It's kind of a political game. Why Shell in the 60s? Well, that was the subject of my 2007 book. So uh, <laughs> that's the question I, I tried to answer in that book, why Shell and not other And it was Shell USA, not Royal Dutch Shell, which would say had a degree of autonomy from uh, the group it's called. And I could go into that. I could talk to you more about that. Yeah? Um, two questions, I guess. Yeah. Uh, one, we we see like the Northern European oil companies becoming big players in offshore wind around the world, especially so in the northeast of the U.S. Do you see the U.S. oil companies making similar plays with their experience with uh, deep water oil? But the companies, but the, certainly the the um, engineering and fabrication and installation companies that install structures offshore, those are not the oil companies. I mean, they, they're just the leaseholder. But, you know, um, some of the big um, 
construction companies. So it's, there is a lot of uh, transfer uh, technology from certainly the, the environmental loads and engineering uh, with offshore platforms that can be applied to and are being applied to uh, wind structures offshore. So I don't think it's so much that well, the oil companies might someday decide that they want to invest in they're saying they're going to at some point uh, once it gets profitable for them. But no, they're they're and they're yeah. And deep water wind is is, is the big thing now when you put these if you can find a way to have maybe some kind of compliance structures out in deep waters and build these giant turbines where the wind is always blowing. That's what they're, they're looking at. I think there there is a lot of crossover with the the fabrication side of offshore. Yeah. Um, so you talked about how like the leases for you know, deep water, super deep water depends like five, eight, or ten years. Um, what happens at the end of these leases, right? So like are they released? And right. is there an incentive for companies to just like deplete all the resources while they have the initial leases? So um, these are called primary leases that they buy at the auction. So in deeper water they're given a longer time to see if there's to prove it up to discover oil and find a way to produce it. And if they don't make a discovery, by the end of that 10-year term, they surrender the lease to the government. Um, if they do make a discovery and file it for a development plan, then they're given a producing lease that lasts as long as, the, as they're able to produce oil. At the end of that time, they have to remove the structure. And this is a big issue now, decommissioning in terms of the Originally 6,000 platforms, now it's down to 3,000. So there have been 3,000 platforms removed. This is an industry unto itself. Mm -hmm. uh, plug and plug abandonment, decommissioning, where you know, companies go in and they take these structures out and scrap them. This is, this is a, there's an industry, have you heard about rigs to reefs? Anyone heard about the rigs to reefs issue? So these platforms, after being there for 30 years, are teeming with marine life. Oh, wow. They become reefs. Um, and uh, there's, you know, there's some scientific debate over whether they just attract marine biomass or if they actually produce marine biomass. And the science team, I think, is pretty solidly in favor of the latter. So these are productive ecosystems, these platforms themselves. And so the states of California and Texas and Louisiana have something called a Rigs to Reefs program, where a company, if it fits the right criteria, can elect to reef the platform in place, you cut it off so that ships don't run over it, or you can move it to a sh shallow water place and leave it for fishermen and divers. So if you go out there in the Gulf of Mexico, they all, the fishermen go right to the platform because that's where all the fish are. Um, and so this is, this, is, this is an issue. Another big issue with the shift from Obama to Trump is there are a lot of small companies. So when the majors went out to deep water, they sold all their assets on the shelf. The smaller companies, like Newfield, right? We're talking. Um, and then those companies would produce and they sell to even smaller companies. So now you've got to leave these fly by night operators in the shallow water who then have to, have to move these platforms and they don't have the financial assurance to do it. And Obama's um, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management tried to formalize or finalize a rule that you know, required them to put up more. Um, I build more bonds so that the you know, taxpayer doesn't get on the hook if they, their, their commissioning costs force them into bankruptcy, then they just walk away from the governments. Um, but the Trump administration rolled back that rule. Um, so the um, effort to try to um, <coughs> you know, insert more uh, financial, uh, liability, financial liability assurance to the US government. So that, that, that's a whole, you know. Um, the other interesting, uh, you hear you hear about well, we should we gotta stop leasing the federal because federal land because these companies have all these leases that they aren't producing in the Gulf. Of well, they have a hundred leases, but they're not producing them anymore. Well, that, that's okay. I mean, they paid the government for they paid them an upfront bonus. They're paying rentals on it. They're trying to see if it's going to be if they can produce on it. And if they don't, they're going to surrender it to the government and we'll be able to lease it again. Um, but the problem with allowing companies to 
mass, such a large leasehold was evident in Deepwater Horizon, and this didn't get much discussion, and I don't really, I meant to investigate a little more. So BP, in 1999, 2000, 2001, acquired a ton of leases in the Gulf of Mexico. And by 2010, a lot of those were expiring. And so they were, even if they weren't rushing that particular well, which, you know, there's been whole years of court proceedings on, on this, there was definitely pressure to, to drill as many of their leases as they could before they rolled over. BP was approaching what they call a lease rollover period. Um, and, you know, I, you know, I can't prove, you know, in court of law that th this was a factor in, in what happened at Deepwater Horizon, but they were, they were definitely, they were definitely in a lease rollover period where things started to speed up from those countries. Take one more question. Yeah. Okay. Well, you, if you read some of the trade press, you hear some, you see some discussion about maybe private equity is getting out of shale because it's so overloaded with debt and you know, just want to stand still. And will private equity now want to get into, into the deep, deep water game? Um, and I don't know if I don't think I'm qualified to answer that question. There, there are other smaller companies. And I'm sure some private equity money working in deep water, um, usually in partnership with the majors. So every one of these, um, and sometimes they become the lead, the operator. So there's usually a majority owner, and then maybe two or three other companies that have minority stakes, like the Macondo well, BP Deepwater Rising was BP and a Darko, and. Um, um, Japanese company, the name of it. Um, so yeah, there there is opportunity in deep water for smaller E and P exploration production focused companies um, like you know um, Cosmos mentioned in Ghana, and they're also involved in Senegal. There's a British company called Tulo Oil. It's in Guyana along with Cosmos or Exxon. Um, so, but I you know you. You, you, there is discussion in the financial community about, well, you know, should we invest in deep water oil? Should we, you know, move our money from fracking and shale to, you know, deep water somewhere? Um, uh, kind of, but then you see other people say, you know, don't compare fracking to deep water. There's a totally different game, um, different players. Except the majors are also involved in shale, but just not, not to the extent that they are in deep water. Shale is still a kind of, you know, a play for large independence now. But you, but you know, the majors are starting to swallow up these companies. So I think we'll, you know, let uh, people go if they need to leave. Okay. Would, would you be willing to stay around? Sure. Uh, and yeah. 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 A few uh, oh, mementos of your visit to do. Thanks. Yeah.